Hi, this is Rob. Welcome back to my channel. It's always something. The something topic in this video is going to be my Chefman RJ38 10 RDO V2 air fryer. Now, I'm not sure what the difference is between a 10 RDO V2 and one that has some kind of a different dash numbers on it, but I'll just be referring to this one as an RJ38. The story behind this Chefman RJ38 goes like this. Exactly one year ago, my daughter bought me this for Christmas. She wanted me to have an air fryer, so I've had this for one year. I've maybe used it a dozen, maybe two dozen times for things like, well, french fries and tater tots. I don't use it for a lot of cooking. So this Chefman was barely used during the last 12 months. Christmas Day comes along, actually Christmas Eve comes along, and I'm cooking a chicken pot pie at 400 degrees in this Chefman RJ38. About uh, 20 minutes into cooking it, it shuts off. I hear it shut off, and I'm thinking, well, that's kind of odd. Usually it beeps, and then the fan runs for a little bit, and that just shut completely off. So I go in my kitchen, I look. None of the lights are on on the front of the uh, unit. And when I open the door, the light doesn't come on on the inside. I uh, unplug it, plug it back in, it's not working, I check my circuit breaker, it's not working, I check my GFCI, it's not working. This unit has completely taken a crap. So, that's why you see it in pieces here on my workbench in my basement. I took this thing apart to find out why it just stopped working. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to explain what I found, how I'm repairing it, and then I'm going to put this back together. Now, I don't have a video that shows how I took this apart, but in the process of putting it back together, for those of you who are brave enough and want to take on the same project, will understand what you need to look for or watch out for or where things need to be taken out to get this thing apart. Now, I've got to put a disclaimer in here since I'm dealing with a kitchen appliance that uses electricity and gets hot and could cause a fire. I am showing this video so people out there with a the Chefman RJ38 units that quit working can understand exactly what one of the problems may be. Should you choose to take apart your Chefman RJ38 and perform a repair like I am doing, that's on you. Don't come after me. You're taking the responsibility as a grown-up to accept the, the risks involved in doing this. So I'm taking the risks to replace the thermal fuse that blew on my unit and I'll show you how I'm doing it and I'll put it back together and we'll see how it works. Now in order for me to do this repair I needed to get some things. I ordered a replacement fuse off of Amazon.com and the original fuse that was in my Chefman was an AUPO BF172 and it looks like the 172 stands for the uh, temperature range that this thing operates at 172 degrees Celsius. Since it is a high temperature fuse, you just can't solder this. So I also had to get some of these uh, crimps. They're actual thermal fuse crimps. They look like they're uh, stainless steel, perhaps. I was able to get a 10 pack of the fuses and the little crimps from Amazon. I think I might have spent like, uh, I don't know, 15, 16 bucks for this stuff. Also, I need some uh, heat shrink. I was able to pick up some heat shrink from my shop. It's just standard heat shrink. Here's a section of wire from my Chefman that has the uh, thermal fuse that's burnt out. I was able to check this once I got it apart by putting a multimeter across both ends uh, with this disconnected from its crimp to the spade terminal on this end here and it of course showed that it was open. This is a stainless steel spade terminal lug. It's crimped to what appears to be some kind of a wire that has a stainless steel core and this just isn't vinyl. This is some kind of a woven fiberglass um, outer uh, uh, insulation on this thing since it is used in a high temp application. There's a crimp here, crimp here, there's heat shrink, there's my thermal fuse, and the other end of this thing was also crimped and I was able to get the crimp apart. The heat shrink on this it appears to have a marking that says it's 125 degrees Celsius. Well, the heat shrink I got, it's, it's also rated in that same range. I picked it up at my shop. So I'm confident that using this heat shrink, 
it has the same rating or if not a little bit better rating than the black heat shrink that they use and it should not be an issue in my repair when I replace this thermal fuse. This is the 172 degree thermal fuse I'm replacing in my air fryer. This is rated for my air fryer. Those of you who are considering replacing the thermal fuses in your air fryers, you need to make sure you get the right rated fuse. Do not just order a 172 like you see on the screen here for your air fryer. You got to make sure you get the right one. This is the specifications for the thermal fuse I ordered, and these are the crimp connectors I picked up off of Amazon to replace the thermal fuse in my air fryer. This obviously is the main oven portion of the uh, air fryer. Turning it around, the power cord comes in the back. If you turn this thing over, what you will find is you'll find there's screws come up through the bottom of this air fryer. Um, I tried taking the screws out on this, but then I realized that taking these screws out doesn't get me to the top of this unit, which is where the thermal fuse is. So I put all the screws back in on my air fryer. Okay, this is my power coming in from the plug. There's a terminal here, terminal here. You see how they're hooked up at the end? There's a induction motor at the top that drives the, uh, let me pull it up closer here, induction motor here at the top that drives the two fan blades that bring air in and move the air around inside the air dryer, the air fryer. On this side of the air fryer, there's a drive motor and there's a belt. Lost the belt, there it is. There's a belt. And my air fryer has a rotisserie on the inside, and this belt drives the little uh, rotisserie gear down here. There's a power control module here at the top. Right here. And there's a ribbon cable that connects to the uh, control display on the uh, front of the unit that's uh, attached to the top cover. This is looking at the back of the top cover. There's an air vent here with a warning uh, placard that says don't operate this thing with it like flush up against your wall. My unit was not flush up against the wall. It was actually in a corner and there was plenty of space behind my unit for air circulation. So that would eliminate in my mind uh, the cost for this thermal fuse to blow. So there's got two fan, uh, fan blades, impellers here. I believe this is the, the one that draws the outside air into the top cover area. It then directs it downwards, and this is the, uh, I guess you can call it the air stir fan that's on the inside. This one here appears to have a little bit of uh, discoloration from the heat with it operating inside the uh, air fryer oven. Okay. Separate this, with the top cover back. This actual the back side of the uh, control, the display slash control of the air fryer. This is the top cover inside the air fryer. It's a heat reflector. There's a thermal sensor that attaches here, uh, and it's wired in to its own small plug. And I'm assuming that uh, allows the control board to monitor and control the temperature according to the setting that you put in the unit when you're running the air fryer. Here's my heater element. It looks nothing more than like a uh, stove element and it goes in to the top cover like this and there's some uh, mounting involved with this. But you'll see uh, when it goes back together how that part goes. This is the cover that I had to remove first to even begin to take the rest of the air fryer apart. This thing is snapped in at one, two, three, four, five, six locations around the perimeter of this, of this top here. And I was able to pry it loose using a, a couple putty knives. This is not designed to be taken apart. So in the process of taking this apart, I ended up having to break a couple of these little plastic clips to get this cover off. Now when it goes back together, I got a solution. I think what I'm gonna do is I'll get a couple little stainless steel screws and I'll use the stainless steel screws to hold this cover back down 
on the top of the air fryer. There's only two clips that I was able to uh, salvage in the disassembly. Let me move it on in, see if it'll pick it up. There's a broken clip there. There's a couple good clips there. There was just no way, there was no way to reach anything in from the edge to uh, push this clip free of the other half without, uh, without breaking it. This is a close up of the uh, high temperature insulated wire and the uh, crimp that's on the end of the thermal fuse. You can see right down the middle there, there's a, like a, 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 a line where the uh, crimper tool pushed everything uh, together when it made the crimp. On the lower side of that line is where my stainless steel wire goes in. On the upper side, the left side of that line, is where my lead coming off the thermal th fuse goes. Now I could cut the wire and restrip it, but I'm going to see if I can separate that uh, crimp, spread the crimp a little bit, and then pull my wire out without having to recut it. Let you know how that goes. I was able to take a small jeweler screwdriver and wedge it into the seam at this uh, brass crimp and by twisting it I was able to spread it enough to uh, slip out the uh, stainless steel wire. So I go to the other end here and I'll get the insulation, the uh, heat shrink pulled back and I'll uh, spread that and that way I'll be able to salvage both ends of my wire without having to shorten them and restrip them. This is my other crimp. I'm going to take a pair of uh, pliers and I'm going to kind of squeeze it from the uh, edgewise from the long end here and uh, hopefully that'll round out the crimp a little bit and then I can get my uh, jeweler screwdriver down there in the uh, seam between the, uh, uh, the wire and the uh, thermal lead. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get on this thing. I don't know if it's going to show up or not. I'm going to basically squeeze it th this way. Not with the, not with the uh, seam, but across the seam. And that should uh, help loosen things up to where the, the uh, jeweler screwdriver will get this apart. Well, how do you like that? Squeezing across the crimp with the pliers, I was able to uh, loosen up the crimp just enough to get the fuse out of one end. And now it's just a matter of me getting this uh, brass uh, crimp sleeve off the end of the wire. Now let's see if I can do this with my camera laying on the table and the uh, sleeve up in front of it. So if I get the jeweler screwdriver in there, spread it a little bit. Not quite yet. That one's tight. And there it is. I've got the uh, brass crimp sleeve off the end of the fuse. And I managed to get my wire out without uh, damaging anything. So I don't have to cut it back and uh, restrip it. Now what this, uh, this shot shows is this shot shows the new style fuse crimp that I have, which is a long one versus the brass fuse crimp that was originally uh, in the uh, thermal fuse. Um, the brass one, the wire and the thermal fuse were placed side by side just like it shows in the picture. Now this new one, I'm going to have to go in from each side of that long silver crimp and push them in from either end and crimp them together like this. Now to crimp my splice, I've got a couple crimpers here at the house. I've got this standard electrician's crimper that you, you know most people have for uh, crimping uh, splices, insulated splices in their in their uh, cars and trucks and around the house, things like that. I'm not going to use this one because when you look at the end on this one, um, this doesn't look like it would do a very good job of do, uh, adequately crimping that splice considering the, the uh, power I'm going to be running through it and the fact that it's used in a, a kitchen appliance. I, I wouldn't feel safe using this type of a crimper. Now I have another type of crimper here that has some different jaws on it and this crimper is usually used for crimping what I call cup splices. And I think you can see that in the picture. The uh, contact here is actually has two ears on either side. The wire goes in one ear and the uh, insulation goes in the larger ear. I think this crimper will do a good job of crimping my splice. I've got my uh, fuse crimp on the end of the fuse and I'm going to try give a test crimp here with these uh, crimpers 
and I'm going to use the setting that says 20 to 22. Let me drop this in, squeeze it on down, make sure that my wire's pushed in all the way, and give it a good squeeze. Let me get a zoom in on that so you can see it better. I had to really honk down on this uh, uh, inexpensive pair of uh, crimper pliers. There, I've got a crimp on that. And giving it a tug and looking at the end of it, I think this will suffice for installing the fuse in my air fryer. Now, before I crimp the uh, wire to the end of the fuse, I'm going to put a little heat shrink on here. Because I don't know if I'll be able to get the heat shrink over that thermal fuse. Install this. Slip the wire into here, and then see if I can't get another good crimp on that thing. <clears throat> good solid tug. That'll work. Make sure my insulation covers the crimp all the way up to the fuse, which it does. And then I'll go ahead and do the other side. Got my uh, second wire crimped to the fuse. Good solid tug. That's not going anywhere. I've cut my insulation to, su to sufficient length to make sure it covers the lead on the fuse, the crimp, and a little bit of the wire. All right, and I get a heat gun at this point. I'll shrink everything down heat shrink's been shrunk down. Everything's looking good. There's a uh, tube here, a woven tube. It looks like it's made out of fiberglass. It's, uh, I'm sure it's high temp resistant. That gets slid over the thermal fuse and at this point I need to check my uh, continuity before I put it back together and find out that I've got a bad fuse even though it's new right out of the package. And the fluke meter says I've got good continuity. Now that I've got my thermal fuse replaced, I'm going to attach it to the top of the metal cover. I have to do this now because if I start assembling things and get to the point where I've got to put the fuse in, there's a nut on the inside that holds this clamp in place and I won't be able to get to it. I've got the uh, fiberglass uh, sleeve over the top of my fuse and I marked the location where the fuse is. And I have to put this clamp right here where the fuse is. I can't put it where the wiring's at. It has to actually press the fuse up hard against this little corner in the uh, uh, sheet metal uh, cover. The end without the terminal spade on it here goes towards where the two holes come up for my heater element. So I'm going to have to loosen this up. I'll attach it and then I'll come back to the video. There, I've got the thermal fuse installed at the clamp and the clamp is at the black mark that I made on the uh, fiberglass sleeve so I know that that thermal fuse is held firmly up against the top of this metal cover. The leads for the uh, thermal fuse here, there's two, there's two holes here that are for the heater element which match up with these two holes on the pan. The wires do not go through those holes. There are two additional holes located right here. The wires go up through the holes located next to where the fan is, not over here along the edge. But before I can put this pan in, I've got to put my fan back together. So there's an upper fan and a lower fan. And if I recall correctly, this is how it goes back together. I might have to take it apart. If I do, I'll correct myself later on in the video. There's the shaft, and the shaft has a flat spot on it, and there's a C-clip. The washer goes on first. Then the upper fan, which is the smaller of the two, goes on and the flat side of the fan, if I recall correctly, goes towards the top and the ears go towards the bottom. Let me see if I could even put it the other way. Yeah, I guess I could put it the other way. I think it goes this way. Oh, maybe it goes the other way. You know, I don't know. God, it's been a couple weeks since I took this thing apart and I'm having a hard time remembering which way this uh, which way these fans blade which way the fan blades go so uh, washer goes on the shaft 
And judging by the little bit of what appears to be dirt and grease on this fan, I'm going to say that the ears are going to go up like that. Then there's a spacer that goes on, small spacer, like this. And that spacer stops right where the threads are for the nut. Now, this point here, I've got to put the, uh, put the cover in. Okay, so the top hand goes in. There's a small hole here this goes through. Another hole over here. Reach around back and get those wires pulled through. Okay, the temperature sensor, there's a small hole just above the temperature sensor. Connector fits through. Make sure all my wires are pulled through and not laying up against the top of the metal pan, and they are. Okay, so at this point here, I can go ahead and I can install my fan. I had this thing about halfway put back together and then I realized I left the little piece of glass out of the corner here where the, the uh, light bulb is. So I'm going to go ahead and set this in place. Hopefully it will stay in place. Feed my wires back through the holes. Come on, get you the hole there, buddy. There we go. There we go. Okay. All right, now that that little lens is back in place, I can continue forward again and reassemble this. I've got the top reflector pan in and I've got to put the screws in. There's four screws that hold this pan, one in each corner here. Now these, there's different types and sizes of screws on this installation, so, you, so I've had to try to keep this stuff separate. And these are these little short stainless steel screws. The stainless steel screws appear to go in the area where it's subjected to grease and, and things like that. So when you go to clean it out, you're not going to cause the screws to corrode. They're stainless steel. So these four screws, one in each corner. I've got the four screws in that hold the reflector pan to the top of the air fryer. And looking at where my fan shaft comes out here, I was questioning whether or not I've got that upper uh, fan blade in correctly. If I had put the fan blade with the ears facing down, they would be hitting on the inside of this uh, reflector panel right now. So I got that part put back together correctly. So my space is in place. Put my inside fan blade on, which gets a washer. Then there's a stainless steel lock washer. And then the nut. And then the nut. And then the nut. Come on. Why oh, you gotta do me like this? There we go. Nope. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll get it. Okay, after that nut was kicking my ass for a little bit, it's a left hand thread on the thing. And we get a, a socket on that and tighten it up. It's a 10 millimeter left handed thread. I gotta be careful I don't, I don't overdo it. This is nothing more than stamped stamped sheet metal that holds all that, that's uh, used on this shaft here. All right, spinning it, I've got no noise, nothing's rubbing. Time to put the burner element in. Now I put the two screws back in the end of the burner element so I didn't misplace them or lose them, but they won't fit through the hole here, so I've got to take those out. Set them to the side, there we go. Drop this over, 
slip it on down. There's uh, two stainless steel screws or lock washers over here where the uh, burner element goes through the pan, and then there's a clamp over on this side. And the clamp's going to kind of go in. It's kind of a zigzag shaped clamp here. Okay, it's going to kind of hook this. I think it hooks two of these elements. So before I bolt everything in, I'm going to hook the two elements on the clamp side. All right, that looks pretty good. Let me put my screws in. This is one of the screws that holds the burner element in place. As I said earlier, these are stainless steel screws and they have a lock washer on them. Burner elements in, screws are tight. That's it for the inside of the oven. Now it's time to turn it over and start dealing with the stuff on the outside. Make sure I don't get my wires crimped over here. Red and blue wires crimped. Just kind of lightly set this in place. And let me move my camera. I've got the top half put in place right now and there's some uh, alignment dowel pins that help made up the upper half with the lower oven part of this. And this is the rotisserie drive motor. This thing is geared and it doesn't turn easily. Now I've got to hook this cog belt that goes down to where the rotisserie, rotisserie uh, sprocket is in here and it's really really stiff and really really tight. So what I found is if I tip this a little bit slip this belt over, then drop the lid back down again, I can get the belt on easily. Let me make sure everything's still lined up. Of course, the belt's pulling the other side up towards it, but that appears to be in. This washer uh, holds the cog belt in place on the rotisserie drive motor. There's a screw, which is a countersunk screw, which to me seems kind of odd, and then there's what looks like a clip. Um, this clip has the end spread out a little bit and I believe this was actually a um, supposed to be a lock washer so I'm going to squeeze that back together when I put this uh, put this washer and this screw back in the rotisserie drive motor right here. So using a pair of pliers I was able to uh, squeeze the uh, lock washer ends back together. Um, it just seems kind of odd what they're using on here instead of a star lock washer. But that goes on the uh, underneath the head of the screw, and then the uh, big washer goes on, and everything gets screwed back together. Okay, there it is. The uh, cog belt retaining washers in place. The lock washers underneath the screw, and there's the screw. I mentioned earlier when I was putting this top down before I attached the cog belt that there were some alignment dowels, and you can see right here at the front where the door opening is, there's an alignment dowel on this side and there's one on the opposite side and then there's a large hole in the very top of this and when you line everything together that dowel then pulls the top into the correct position with the lower section of the oven. Ah crap, this little uh, glass window goes in where the, uh, where the light bulb is and you just can't insert it through the top here so I'm going to have to pull, pull some stuff back apart, go back, and then uh, put this little glass window back in. Okay, my next step at this point is to connect the blue and red leads. It really doesn't matter which lead you connect to which end of the heater element. The heater element just doesn't care. As long as it gets uh, 110 volts, it'll work. And i got to be careful I don't bend the end of the heater element when I'm tightening up these screws. It's a very thin uh, wire element that goes on down through the uh, insulator here. That's tight. That's tight. That's not hitting each other. Come around to the side with the uh, thermal fuse wire coming out the top of the uh, air fryer. Connect my power wire coming from the electrical plug. Twist the two ends of the wire together where it's been stripped and then put my uh, uh, my cap on here. Now for this cap, since it's insulated, I can use this type of a crimper here. So that's been put on. Let me pull it. It's tight. Tight. Turning the air fryer around, coming over to the side with the rotisserie drive motor. There's a circuit board. The 
spade terminal on the circuit board here is connects the red wire that goes to the thermal fuse. Also, I have my lead from the uh, temperature sensor that's in the uh, uh, reflector pan inside, and that gets connected to a small two-pin connector right here by the ribbon connector. Let me put some of this stuff out of the way. One of the things I want to point out right now is that um, one of the issues that you could have with this is this switch. Where is it at? Right here. This is a door interlock switch. If, uh, if uh, this thing doesn't work, it could be that you have a bad switch and they're easy enough to change and you can get them all day long on the internet. Before I connect my ribbon cable to my control panel and put the top on, there's six screws that hold the upper portion of the oven to the lower portion of the oven. One here, one here, one here, 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 and here. At this point, I'm down to uh, the last bit of screws, and I wished I had paid more attention when I was taking this thing apart as to which hole which screw came out of. So what I'm left with, I'm left with um, one screw that's a bigger diameter, or actually four of them that are a bigger diameter, six that are a shorter screw, and six that are a longer screw. And I've divided them up into little piles. And this is what I think. I think the larger diameter screws are going to go in the four holes in the very top. One over here, one over here. The shorter screws are going to go into the holes that are in the top adjacent to the holes where the big screw went and down over here where the control panel is there's two more places and I think these are the shorter screws and the last place is the longer screws are going to go and hold the top part of the air fryer onto the oven part of the air fryer so I've got um, let's see I've got uh, Screws down over here, here, and down here in this little corner here. And there's six of them all the way around the edge. So I think that's where I need to put my screws when they go back together. So I'm ready to put the top back on. I noticed there was this um, fiberglass sleeve. I wasn't sure where it went. Uh, looking at the other end of the power wires coming in, where the cord that plugs into the wall is attached to these and crimped in. They also have one of these sleeves, so I'm assuming this is some sort of a heat protection or fire protection. So I'm going to slip these over here and I'll uh, zip tie them down and I'm ready to put my top on and control panel in. So I've got, I've got my top cover on here. I've got the four large screws in the four holes at the top. I was mistaken. There's two screws here that actually attach this cover. Now I'm down to the point now where all I have to do is connect my ribbon cable, connected, and this just slots in at the bottom, tip it forward towards me, clear the top, and I'll put the four screws in that hold the top on. Now I mentioned when I pried this uh, cover off here, this vent cover, uh, I broke the ears on the cover. You can see the ears are broken right there. And I have to have some kind of way to reinstall this cover. Right here in the middle, since this is raised up, there's, there's a gap between the cover and this piece here. So right here in the middle is this hump where it comes up, and down below it is the uh, motor for the uh, fan. And what I decided to do was I would take my cover and put a hole right in the middle of it, put it back in, and using a very, very, very short stainless steel screw, I don't want to use something too long because that end of the screw will go into the, uh, the top end of the uh, fan motor. And I'll just put the screw in this hole, and that'll hold this cover on. I've got my uh, stainless steel coarse threaded screw, sheet metal screw, right here in the middle. And I can tell by pushing at the top the amount of flex that I get that the screw tip has not uh, been driven into the uh, top of that uh, fan motor. Well, I've got my air fryer back together. As you can see, it's powered up. Open the door. Light on the inside works. You can hear the fans running like it should. 
kicks back in. Um, earlier in the video, one of the things I've noticed now that I've got it fixed and everything's, everything's working is that there's a vent here on the back, and I think in my video I said that this is an intake for the air fryer. This is actually an exhaust. So if this is an exhaust, how does the air get through the air fryer to exhaust out here? Down here on the bottom of the air fryer is the inlet. And what that fan does, at least the upper half of the fan, is it draws air in from the bottom between the inner metal oven and then it, it keeps the plastic cool and it dumps all that excess hot air out the back. And there's a placard that says don't put this up against the wall. Well, there's a reason I don't want you to put it up against the wall because if you block this thing, you're going to overheat your uh, air fryer. Now, I had mine in the corner, so this was well enough away from the wall. Now, the fan on the inside, what it does is since it's behind the heating element, it actually pushes the air down onto the food as things are cooking. So you've got one fan motor, two fans, and the two fans do two different things. They serve two different purposes. Um, now, as to why mine blew when I was cooking a chicken pot pie at 400 degrees 12 months into the uh, owning this uh, air fryer, I have no idea. The thermal fuse is 170 two degrees Celsius which is 340 degrees Fahrenheit. So if I'm running the oven at 400 degrees, um, you would think well, that's, that's above 340. But I think since the fuse is a safety fuse, I think the 172 degrees was picked because they're relying on the main controller uh, to keep the heat where it needs to be. So if I have it set for 400 degrees, the temperature inside the oven is 400 degrees, and that's detected from that small temperature sensor that's uh, mounted to the top pan. Now, if that temperature, temperature sensor fails, I believe the thermal fuse is there as a backup. And in the area where they mount the thermal fuse, even though the oven's 400 degrees, that area where the thermal fuse is should not get above 172 Celsius or 340 degrees. And if it does get up above 340 degrees, 172 degrees Celsius, then the fuse does its job and it opens. One of the possibilities could be that my normal temperature sensor uh, didn't shut the heating element off at 400 degrees and it allowed that thermal switch to get too hot. I don't know. It appears to be working properly now. You can see near the end there it, uh, it uh, beeped and uh, the fan kind of sped up after the heating element kicked out to uh, cool down the heating element and uh, if I was cooking a chicken pot pie today that chicken pot pie would be uh, would be done. Looking at reviews on Amazon one of the things I noticed about the Chefman air fryers you know you got the five star reviews people love it the four star reviews but when you get down to looking at the one star reviews pretty much all of them say the same thing this thing just quit working and some of them was, was, was within one month, two months, six months, like myself, a year or within a couple years. It just goes dead like it did on me. I was able to get mine fixed for the cost of a, a pack of 10 thermal fuses and a pack of uh, crepes for that thermal fuse. Um, I'm going to put this back, I'm going to let this thing probably run for 45 more minutes today while I work on putting my video together and I'm going to make the assumption at this point that my air fryer's back in business. Thanks for watching. Hope you all enjoyed the video. Hope maybe those of you who have similar problems learn something about your air fryer and why it would fail. Uh, but yeah, thanks for watching. Have a great day. Peace out.